Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Turnic Tips. And back again this week is Warren Ness with Rock Sculptor. And we're going to kind of complete our little series that we're doing here on blending color. We've got some pretty good uh, visuals for you today. You're going to see what we're talking about when we kind of cover grayscale and adding colors to the gray instead of doing it the other way around and just kind of walk you through step by step how to build color to show you the contrast of how we do it and how it brings to life those things that we're really trying to do to to bring the reality of whether it's rock or wood or or whatever um, to life to make it look like it's authentic um, and in some cases probably better so Hey, Warren, how's things today? Things are going great. Everything is going great. Fantastic. Awesome. All right, let's, um, let's just jump right in. And um, I know we had a little screen sharing thing and you should be authorized. So let's, uh, let's start off by talking about it. I know last week we covered, and one of the things that kind of jumped out to me that I didn't really realize was the importance of starting with the correct gray um, because it's just so prominent in everything that that's naturally occurring and then adding the color to the gray. So if you could kind of clarify of why we do that and the process behind actually making that, we'll start there and then just walk right through with adding the colors to that. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks for the intro, Bob. So um, like you alluded to, making things look authentic or having a, a, a pulse um, where it looks alive. A lot of guys that are in this industry, um, some of them come from art backgrounds, some of them are just contractors, but they do, they can dis distinguish when something looks off. They may not be able to identify it, but a lot of times they can identify that it's, it's something looks off or lacks a pulse. And um, a lot of times we call that muddiness where things become muddy and yeah. lost. And within that comes into conversation of the color gray. Gray is a powerful, it's not a color, right? It represents neutral, yeah. right? Half black, half white, half light, half dark, however you want to call it, um, represents that balance. And um, a lot of times if you don't use the gray and even simulating wood tones that um, are pretty bright, We'll get into like the darkness and brightness of things. Mm -hmm. But um, if you don't, we, you end up what we call with the fruit cocktail effect, where things just look too bright, oversaturated, and look off, back to that word off. So we're going to dive in today and um, talk about the use of gray and why it's important, especially with uh, these examples that we're using today with simulated rock and simulated wood textures. So um, like you touched on last week, Bob, um, starting, you know, mixing a color, a lot of times guys will start with the color and then add gray. The problem is you're on the wrong side of the scale. And um, I want to show you what a 20% gray looks like, um, at least in digital form. So let me bring up that, uh, that graphic real quick. Okay. And it's this one right here. Pretty simple. You can see the, the bar chart up at the top. Um, going from 0% on the left, 100%, which is black on the right, that 50% is your mid-tone, okay? Pretty simple. Um, a lot of the grays that I use are from the 10 to 40. Um, a lot of times the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, for base tones, we'll use those more of those for washes, and we'll get into more of that as we uh, um, get more episode under our belt. But for today, we want to stick with the grays and the warm grays. Now, the term warm gray is just mostly gray with a little bit of color added to it. Still characterizes a gray, because you heard the term warm gray and cool grays, still a gray, but has a little bit of color. So I'll zoom in, and as you can see, each succession, each step to the right, you can see the different levels of um, warm gray that are there. That's the same amount of Simpsonite yellow. You see Simpsonite yellow off to the right gives you a color swatch. Those of you who are familiar with the color system, I know you can probably track along just fine. But adding that little bit of Simpsonite yellow to a 20% gray 
would give you that tone right there. And then I'll zoom out and leave it there. I just wanted to zoom in and give you a, a representation of what I'm talking about. So um, those are really important. If you start too bright, guys like white, using white Portland cement, and Bob, we've touched on this many times, right? The federal white, a lot of GFRCers love it. Mm -hmm. it. It tends to give out bright colors. Some of the old school guys are still using acid stain. And they really, there's a, there's a trade-off in that. You get brighter tones, especially when you seal it with solvent base. And we'll get more into the specifics later, but they all impact kind of what we're talking about. And a lot of it is just neutralizing that color and knowing what brightness you need to land at. Okay, so in this example, we're just talking about grays and adding color to it. And as you can see in this episode, we've got some live video of um, in small scale, uh, mixing in, mixing up a gray and then adding this Simpsonite yellow to it to warm it up. And again, what's lastly, before I go rambling on anymore, uh, what's nice about it is you can really season it to taste. You can always start adding a little bit of color, mix it. And don't really rely on the representation that you see when you're mixing it applied to the substrate. In this example, I'm using watercolor paper, which is a heavy textured colored paper like concrete. It's very porous. And, um, but I, I encourage you to kind of test us on those sample. So nevertheless, that's the introduction to kind of gray in this episode. And um, yeah, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of it. Hey, what's up guys? Warren is here with Rock Sculptor. Today, I'm gonna to show you the simplest way to make up a gray. And we're gonna be about a 20% range. The easiest way to do that is to start with your absolute white. So um, these are small mixing containers. Um, we're doing a small sample in this scenario. But if you were doing a larger um, project, you could use buckets, any other measuring devices that are skilled to your project. So absolute white, colors being used. Paleo black. Now the easiest way to do this, I'm gonna bring the camera in. The easiest way to mix this is to start with all your white because it's not gonna take much black. I'm gonna put a drop in there. You can see how quickly it tinted that. And I think that's about right where I want it. That's it. All right. So now the next step, guys, is we're gonna take that gray because that's a little on the bluish side. If you're looking for the bluish side, it's fine. But the next step, we're going to add Simpsonite yellow to that and we're going to warm it up. Stay tuned. So when you're talking about warm versus cool gray, I think, you know, I think most people have some sort of a, a sense that, you know, the warm grays tend to be a little bit more of the earth tonies and the cooler grays are a little more of the blues, you know, a little bit more of that end of the UV spectrum there. Yep. Um, and it's important when you're trying to be as authentic as you can, because when you just look at what occurs in nature, it's more of the warm, warm tones. Now, not to say that there's not jobs that you can't do the, um, you know, the cooler grays because sometimes, Hey, that's a cool gray. We love concrete. Right. And then right. in the GFRC world, if they're doing a white Portland cement in the architectural precast world is generally white Portland cement because of all the advantages of white over gray, but sometimes you still want that color. So now you can go back with a cooler gray and achieve all that, you know, whether it's an integral color or a topical color, like we're talking here, but I just kind of wanted to clarify that, that, you know, that there's I'm sure there's people watching and go, what the heck's he talking about a warm gray, you know? Right. Right. And, <clears throat> and they're spot on on that. Um, if you look at the chart on the top, the very first chart, if you notice the color comparison, you can almost see it, it being a little on the bluish side, just mm -hmm. inherently especially now that you have in your peripheral vision, you have the background color and I'm going to toggle those real quick for demonstration here today. Look what happened when I took the gray away on the background. Okay. Yeah. Colors change. Now the, the chart on the top appears to be a little more bluer in my eyes mm -hmm. depending on your device that you're viewing it from and the color temperature uh, of the device. So, and then lastly, yeah. So, that kind of gives you that background. That's why I show the bottom chart on a 75% dark background. So it's very important to understand that the color is being next to. So in our, um, in our demonstration, you'll see when we take paleo black and absolute white and we make a gray, 
inherently it's going to look probably something like that, like that 20%, which again, it appears on the bluish side. And a lot of that is, is the, the phenomenon of the color behind it. You could either pull the warmness out or the coolness out, depending on what you spread on. And lastly, to touch on some of the stone out there, not necessarily wood grains. I think wood grains are outside the coal um, family. Yeah. But your Pennsylvania bluestone, especially your neck of the woods, a right. uh, lot of blues in there. So, um, yeah, it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, it's almost a slaty color, you know, maybe even a little more blue than what we've got there. But, um, you know, that's achievable depending on what blends you want. I think the, you know, the idea here is just to not get hung up on, hey, is 20% literally like 80% white and 20% gray? No, it's not. It's relative. So don't get hung up on exact measurements. Um, you know, you're, you you're great for reference photos, right? Like what is it that you want to make, plate it out, put it down. And um, the one thing I want to touch on is you're using watercolor paper. Um, you know, what's a good source for that or what's a good substitute? Can we just use plain old construction paper that you can get at, you know, Walmart? Um, I like the, I like the watercolor paper um, and the source of that your, your art stores would have that. It's pretty heavy. Um, pretty heavy density, so it doesn't leak through and it doesn't even curl my paper. So I can use that for swatches and, um, and things like that and make it permanent. So if, I, if I'm working on a project and require some custom blending up front to try to get it right, and I, I would do it on the color paper and I write down my measurements. And then from there, you kind of know how it's gonna react on the substrate. And with time and practice, of course, you're going to be able to train your eye to know where you need to be, plus or minus. So the watercolor paper is nice because, again, it's textured. It's porous like concrete. It exhibits a lot of those characteristics, mm -hmm. and it doesn't wrinkle my paper, so it's semi-permanent. I can cut it out, put it in my book, log it, especially guys that have employees. Um, writing down these recipes from all jobs become really important for touch-ups and things like that or, hey – I seen a project photo that you just did. Now you don't have to do the legwork. You can give the, the recipes to your guys and sure. they can knock out, knock out a top. Yeah, and I think I, that's a big advantage um, to know how to do this, which is really kind of why we're explaining all this in this series of videos is you don't have to pay for custom colors because you get to create them. And quite honestly, you want to create them. It might seem easier up front to just have someone else do that work for you. But if, if you need to adjust, you need to know how to do that. And quite honestly, because we're, you know, we're a for-profit business as everyone that's watching this is, is we want to be able to do as much of that ourselves as possible and broaden our, you know, build a bigger toolbox, if you will, that we get to pull from out on a job site. And, you know, especially when, John Q customer comes up with the, Hey, as long as you're here, can you build me a rock to go along with this? And, right. uh, you know, and so you get a little bit of a mid job pivot, which means more profit and, you know, um, you know, great example right here. Right. So go ahead and explain what the heck we got going on here. Yeah. So basically this is a, uh, a, a similar piece of rock, um, kind of zoomed in on a texture What's nice about this photo, it doesn't have a whole lot of harsh um, ambient light, very soft, so we can identify the colors. That's the other thing, too, how you're viewing your colors. Are you viewing in the sunshine, fluorescent light? Those are all factors that play a factor in training your eye because what, what it looks over here in the shop versus now we open up the front door, bring it outside, and it's like, whoa, what do we have here? So I thought this picture was very important because it was photographed outside. And it's predominantly, it looks gray, like, but there's a lot going on there within those subtleties. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of warmness. I didn't mean to do that, but let me uh, erase. Try to zoom in here. But there's a lot of warmness going on um, that you would probably see more in the physical as opposed to the, the photograph. But this base coat was started with that 20% kind of warm gray and possibly even going up to 30% as a base tone. When I consider base tone, let me clarify base tone. Something that's covering up most of the concrete. When I say most of the concrete, about 80, 80 to 85. I never want 100% cover the concrete, 
I want areas of void because it gives me more variety. A lot of times when we're, and I'm dipping into the application side of things, Bob, a little bit now, but. Yeah, but you know, the point, of, the point yeah. being is that you're not, um, you don't want anything monolithic. So you don't necessarily want to start with, and concrete inherently isn't totally monolithic when you start, whether you're using gray. If you use white, you know, you get different textures in that white. So even the white, isn't totally monolithic but you know that was a that's a good point to bring up that hey don't you know don't go ahead and just because it says a base tone don't think that you need to use it like a primer in that's a very primer. good point and a lot of times that i've seen in the training is that they're going for 100 percent coverage and um i leave about 80 percent again it adds to variety um the beauty of this system too is again adding colors as you go base tone I'm going to start more subdued, work darker as it moves forward, yep. and I could add. Now, that chaoticness or, I guess, um, unpreciseness of things adds to the flavor, the end result. Mm -hmm. Because if you mix that same recipe twice without measuring, just eyeballing, you're going to get a different variety, and it adds to the overall um, flavor of things. Yeah. So, which yeah. is a bonus, right? Again, not to go back and beat a dead horse, but don't get hung up on the exact measurements. So um, you know, like as you can see in the video of blending the white and the gray, uh, or the white and the black to make gray, you know, it's not measured. It's, it's based on the gray scale of, hey, I want about a 20%, right? So you mix it up, you, you stir it up nice, put it on a substrate to mimic it and go, yup, that's about right. And you know that that's, that's about where you want it. And then the next step past that is now add the color to that. So like in the video, you're in, you, the, you'll see here where we're adding the Simpsonite yellow to it, you're adding the Simpsonite yellow to it. Um, again, it's not an exact measurement, but you're able to do that to adjust to whatever you want, always going from light to dark. Okay, guys, here's a sample piece of uh, SCC concrete. You see the gray on the back. Uh, substrate base tones are important, um, and we'll get more into that on more episodes. But for today, I want to let you show you this is a finished piece of wood or a simulated piece of wood. We um, took three about three passes of different colors on here, in which we started with a 20% gray warm gray. Let me show you how to warm that up. So what we're going to do is we'll take this 20% gray, bring that camera in a little bit. Let me show you before that, bring this paper up over here. I'll show you what this gray looks like on the paper. You can see it's more, I guess on white, it's gray, but it's, it's still on the bluish side, right? Slightly. Now, here's the, here's the magic trick. Add a little bit of Simpsonite yellow to this. Go a little bit more. And then you'll notice it's it's still gray. Actually, we'll we'll stop there and we'll see. We'll we'll put a brush stroke on there. Alright guys, let me let this uh, let me clean this brush and then we'll go ahead and put that sample on the paper. Let's start that Simpsonite yellow in. Let's put a stroke right next to the one right here. This just has a little bit of Simpsonite, and you can see a big difference. This is a beautiful base tone for oxidized wood and stuff like that. Okay, we're gonna let that dry. And then the um, next step, we're gonna add a little more yellow and probably a little more yellow to kind of show you the progression on how um, more color intensity is added. So the next step, I'm gonna add a little more yellow into this. Something like that. And you can see when you're mixing the color, it's hard to really um, identify and how much it's shifted. That's why I always kind of proceed in slow steps. I'm gonna wipe this brush off real quick, dip it in here, and then we'll put a stroke right next to this. And let that dry. Okay guys, we're gonna let that dry. I'm gonna do it one last time, and then we should be wrapping this up. One last time, I'm gonna dose the Simpsonite yellow a little more and that's going to be our last kind of I think step it really shows you how you can start from a gray warm it up and then start to add more color to it 
So we'll stir that up and let's brush it on. Yeah, always going from light to dark. Now, on the artistic side, um, here, here's a little tip. Um, colors placed next to gray have a, a, a potent effect. There's something vibrating about it. It's that the color contrasted against gray, that color appears to be a little brighter than what it really is because of the, the simultaneous contrast that's going on because color is relative. So that's, again, another reason why I like gray, because we get that electric effect out of it. Any color contrasting on gray um, is a little more under the spotlight. It's going to make that color hum a little more. So, and to touch on what you stated, it's, it's all about the brightness. You know, white quartz is kind of white, right? It's not pure white, but um, kind of like snow. Snow has a level of brightness, pretty bright. Right. A piece of charcoal is, is on a brightness of low, right? So if you start looking at these items, what's the end goal? What's the brightness you're trying to hit? Okay, so if it's antique bronze, kind of darker as opposed to like a yellow pine. Mm -hmm. And just kind of looking at different materials and training your eye on what do you think that brightness is? And look at that scale factor, zero being white, 100% being black. Where does it kind of land? That's gonna help you kind of develop the skill set to help zero in and to figure out those color recipes as quick as you can and obviously for profit right if you could shorten that length you're going to be more profitable yeah and i you know i don't want people to get overwhelmed um you know when you hear us talking about you know do some trials or you know over time and things like that i mean literally over time can be like 10 minutes you know if you if your stuff's going to dry that fast right so you can you can add a little bit in our in our case with the, the little short video here is adding Simpsonite yellow to it to kind of get that that nice color that we're working with. It, it's a few minutes, you know that it's not several years or or training. Anyone can do this. You can you can easily take this stuff and just have fun with it. You know, don't get all intimidated by it. It's not hard but it's wow. something that you can, you can even shift on a job site. You know, you could put it up and go, ah, that's a little too bright. Okay, so make the shift. That's really it. Um, you said it best right there. It only takes 10 minutes. And a lot of job, 80% of the time, I still do that process. I'll mm -hmm. put a little swatch up, see where it drives. Because you don't know where you start. You're almost kind of throwing a blank out right out of the chute. So just kind of know that first test Black, white, Simpsonite yellow is a starting point. You're going to know whether you overdose the Simpsonite yellow or underdosed. Yep. So, uh, and so, this could be any, any other color too. So let's just say, in, you know, in this example that, hey, I do overdose the yellow. Um, you know, can we just add more gray to that to smooth it out? Or is it a start over or maybe both? That's a very, very good question. Yes, you can start over. The problem is the, there's a byproduct to that. And the more you build up and kind of cover the authenticity of the concrete, mortar, textured surfaces, it kind of takes away. So um, if you want to look at the, a as far as a baseball, yeah, as far as a baseball analogy, the home run is the lesser amount of coats put you on, put, you know, put you on that home run state. Sure. The triple and the double is where you're kind of coating it and you're kind of troubleshooting from there. And when you end up troubleshooting, you end up putting more, um, material on the surface in which depending on your substrate texture if there is texture you, you kind of cloud that other um component up which is the texture component yeah that's right so you're taking away a little bit of that visual depth and, and yeah. detail yep so it's the more you do it the more painted it's going to become so hence the point of bringing that up is to um you know take the 10 minutes five minutes whatever it is and just you know throw some color down on um, you know, Warren's 
watercolor paper. <laughs> and, uh, paper and, and, and we use all parts of the pig in the shop. So all like, like miscast, broken pieces, everything is saved. In fact, every job, I think we touched on some of the other um, episodes, but uh, I'll cast make or a piece, in yeah. a baking pan, the same mix. And now I've got my so-called watercolor paper or cement substrate ready to go for, for test swatching. Right. Yeah. Cool. Hey, can you, um, can you share the next pick? Yep. And yep. I think these next ones are, is really gonna, you know, first of all, what is kind of the, I don't know, I'm not going to say it's the next thing, but a lot of people are doing it because it just naturally has a ton of advantages and there's some really good examples. I'll just close it one second. Open it back up. Nipple images. Okay, open this one up. Minimize. These guys, um, you know, the some of the pictures that we're going to show here, um, one of which, I, mean, I think Joe Dietz, Steve Beachy, I don't know who did that rock, but you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back in the shop. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I thought this was good. I think it's like, it's, if you look at the gray, I think we touched on it in, in, in our conversation here today. Um, gray next to color ne place next to it has, it can have a profound effect. And I obviously, I think I used that here. Um, this picture, you see Joe Dietz, and we're just thumbing through these, Bob. Yeah, um, that's fine, man. Just um, to, to kind of go through yeah. this one, um, you know, it, it was done. I'm going to, you know, I don't know for sure. We'd have to have Joe chime in and maybe he can do that in the comments, but I'm, I'm about guaranteeing that he did, you know, a, a light gray, 20% maybe ish, a um, little bit of a yellow undertone to get that kind of tannish, natural, fresher wood color, and then built the darker colors on top. Yep. You can kind of see it in the front rail there where it's almost highlighted, where it shows off the different texture of the green. Yeah. And, um, and to, to, to piggyback on what you said, um, and also look how much color is added. Like, yeah. so gray contains no color, right? One side of the spectrum. And then look at all the colors. I'm going to guess he's got the uh, earth brown in there some paleo black mixed in with some earth brown and some primitive red mixed in with some tamarack brown to get that reddish mahogany ash that, color. Yeah. That, well, uh, <clears throat> like the English leather, you know, yep. beautiful piece, beautiful, beautiful piece. Look at that. But yeah. still kept in there. Had he not base toned it and these other examples are going to highlight that. Had he not base toned it and just went browns. It's brown. That's what you said, Bob lacks the authenticity or lacks the pulse. It yeah. starts to look dead. And that's where the glazing, we'll, we'll dive into that in more episodes, but the glazing um, capabilities of this product. Cool. So, All right. There's that one. Oh, yeah, there's where I started. And this is Steve Beachy, right? This is his. Um, I think this one's actually his personal top. But, um, so um, you want to explain uh this process or you want to move on to the next next uh no run through this one because this is this is a good analogy i mean here it is really nothing on it right um kind of out of the form yep. of their processing right. and then um, the next one is showing the base tone yep you did a good job stop here. like like you said before we gather on because the colors is, is, is designed to work on a, a multitude of different substrates, right? Vertical, mm -hmm. horizontal, there's different porosities, different mix designs, different sands, etc. But like Bob said earlier, if you look at the, the color of this, if you squint your eyes a little bit, you'll notice variations in the gray. There's some subtle, like real light gray, would I say 20? And you can also see kind of a 30 in there. Um, and this will make more sense as you train your eye and get more mileage behind you. But let's go to the next photo. And, yeah, and the cool thing, I mean, that's why we love concrete, right? Is it's doing part of the work for you right out front. You know, if 
you know, unless you're looking for a super monolithic surface, and in that case, it could drive you crazy, um, you know, you can compensate it with a topical color. But the, the point of this is to get that, that contrast, that movement, though, all those things that occur in nature. Correct. And, you know, and I think, you know, Steve here, um, just looking at it, it looks like part of it he used, you can see his sample piece off to the left. It's pretty cool. He's got uh, a live reference there under that same lighting, ambient light conditions. If you look off to the left, there's kind of a yellowish piece of wood. And I'm just going to guess that that's part of part of his reference that he's trying to hit. I know Joe Probably D his backsplash that he said, oh, well, if anything goes wrong, at least I can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, look at the intense yellow. That yellow is not really grayed down. And this is the other versatility of the product. But it appears Steve's using the gray substrate yeah. to overlay to knock down that yellow. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the first thought is somebody in the novice level puts that yellow down. What are they going to do? Oh, no, take it off. It's, it's, this is wrong. The, the, you know, the, the red alerts are going off everywhere. But um, you can see as he puts the yellow on, you can still see the undertones. So if you squint your eyes, yeah. if the light just looks right, you can see variations of that yellow. Being a little darker, notice, like I said, that 20% gray. If you notice, just off to this left here, look at those subtle variations. Might not look much, but it really shows up on the stat sheet on the finished product. Yeah, no doubt. And here's the finished. Look at that. Yep. It, yeah, there's the pulse. So without that warm under base, um, this piece does not does not jump off the way it's doing. And he did an exceptional job on that, really did. Just, it's beautiful, it's alive. It looks like it has a pulse and, and blood running through it. Yeah, that came out super, super nice. Um, so let's, uh, let's give some final words and start to land this plane. And uh, All right. you know, I think, you know, some of the things that we've covered, um, you know, the washes, it, you know, it's an application technique and we, we can cover that. Um, probably the best thing to do is we'll post some videos uh, here on our YouTube channel of uh, physically doing some washes. So maybe not a Trinic Tips episode, but a bonus to a Trinic Tips episode that you can see some application techniques of this to physically see it going down. And we're going to be continually adding everything to this because it's our goal to you know, get you guys out there where you can make stuff like this every day and make a living at it, you know, just start killing it with what you've seen here and, and do greater things. And, you know, there's a reason why, I mean, Warren's rock was there. I had to pick on him about making that good. Quite honestly, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, so there's a reason why I use our customers' photos because they're better at it than I am. <laughs> but, uh, you know, really, we talked about, um, you know, the, well, well, actually, let me touch on this. One of the things we talked about was the effects of sealing it. So, again, back to the sample piece, right? Like, if you use a solvent based sealer or some water based urethanes, you have different levels of color enhancement, you have different levels of sheen, which are going to change things. And I see it happen a lot where people will go and take a, a piece that they spent tons of time or a project they spent time on coloring, the color came out banging. And then they put a high depth, high gloss sealer on it. And, you know, it, it steps it back a couple of notches. So look, it really comes down to what the customer wants. You know, people say, well, why do you always make concrete try and look like granite in the countertop world? Or why do you want concrete to look like quartz? Because that's what the customer's paying for, right? right. And if that's what they want, do it. But if you have artistic license and your goal is to put out authentic pieces that really just, you know, absolutely mirror what occurs in nature, make sure you keep your sealer choice in, in the back of your mind that, hey, this might look a little bit lighter. It might be a little bit more pale. It may not have quite the pop or jump or pulse that we were using here for terms. But when you seal it, it will. Just don't go too far with it. So again, back to, you know, do a quick sample, 
Sealers dry quick. You can speed dry them most of the time with a heat gun. Solvent ones go real quick. And it, again, it gives you an idea of what your final product is going to be without killing yourself of having to, um, you know, do it mid project. Absolutely. That's, that's a hundred percent fact, hundred percent fact. You got to do the sample. You got to do a test run and um, it pays huge dividends in the end. Anyway, I, I don't even think it's a setback of time. You, you're going to be so much more efficient and speedier through the process and confident that um, it pays huge dividends all the way down to the sealer. Cause you're right. The sealer will um, impact it in a positive way or a negative way. And that's, you know, um, subjective per client or per customer. Yeah, I think, you know, positive, it turns out the way you or your client wants it to. Negative is the way it doesn't turn out the way you want it to. So if you do want that super deep, you know, high shine look, then rock it out. Just be aware that, you know, that's what you're going to need to do. Um, can you stop the screen share for a minute while we close yep. this out? I think we're done with that slide. So if, um, you know, if you guys want these slides, um, you know, let us know if you want them separately, we can, you know, provide those to you for whatever reason. If you have questions on them, obviously let us know. Um, we can do, you know, we're happy to help and coach and, and do all that, but quite honestly, just have fun with this stuff. It's, it's such a cool way to do really anything that you can imagine. Um, you know, no matter what colors you use, but we really wanted to spend some time. Obviously we think we've done a total of four episodes, one in the beginning and then three in the series to explain a little bit about how you can be super authentic with this. And this is a great tool to have in your toolbox that a lot of people just get overwhelmed with, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, you know, look, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, if I can do it, anyone can do it because there's not an artistic bone in my body. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I'm learning a lot, um, you know, from you, Warren, and from seeing other people's stuff out there. And, you know, I appreciate the posts that you guys share with us, you know, our, our customers and um, our not yet customers that, um, you know, share these just right. crazy pictures, these, you know, insane jobs that um you know people are just killing it on and it's just doing so much to move this industry forward and that's really what it is especially in this time you know there's there's a certain uneasiness with the whole covid thing and you know the political environment being an election year and everything else but it's almost comforting to go back to this is what we do and man this is really working well for us um you know, the, the thing that I like about it from a profitability standpoint is the, the higher the end, the higher end work you do, the less it relies on a client that's living paycheck to paycheck. You know, a lot of these clients that, that um, you're working for, either they're commercial or they're, you know, they're high end clients that are willing to pay for an authentic looking piece, rockscape, landscape, extruded curbing, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, theme parks with climbing walls and, you know, the list goes on and on and on, but that's solid work that's out there that, you know, the, the people watching this video, Warren, and, you know, us included get to participate in that's, it's almost recession proof. It really is. I mean, and, you know, I lived through the, the 08 crisis or, or any type of economic downturn. Um, you know, typically artists are usually like low, low on the food chain, but we're, we're not, we're not providing art to hang on the wall. This is functional art. And in the land of what we call this, people are investing more money and effort into a staycation. People are investing more into their home at this point in time than in any historical record. So, and that goes anywhere from, you know, pole scapes, lounge chairs, concrete countertops, vanity tops, soup to nuts. And concrete is buzzing. I mean, there's billions of yards coated of this on earth with concrete. Um, it's got a good backbone. It's got a good track record if done correctly. Um, just like yeah. everything. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. <clears throat> um, 
so today I'd go get my truck inspected, right? And, the, and I'm friends with a guy that has the garage and he comes out and he's like, hey, who do you know that can do concrete? And shows me some of the pictures of this awful retaining wall. I mean, it was, oh, I, I have no idea how this guy even decided that he was doing concrete, <laughs> right? But right. two pieces of plywood, hardly any bracing. It's got the, the snake to it. It goes anywhere from three foot wide to 18 inches wide and back again. Wow. And, and uh, so as, uh, as my mechanic is talking to me, he's like, you know, we got 80 grand into this pool. He goes, I got more money into the pool than I got into my house. And he's like, we just want it fixed. We want it right. And so we got talking and there's, you know, there's a couple of local contractors that use our stuff, obviously. So I turned them on to them, but uh, to the, to the point of, if there's work to be done out there and we do it well, there's a lot of work. You know, I showed him a couple pictures and this dude is hooked. First of all, he needs to fix the concrete that's there because it's not structurally yeah. right. But, <laughs> um, but you know, it was, he's got a retaining wall at the shop that he wants to do. And he starts looking at it from a marketing perspective that, okay, my stacked plain old concrete barrier walls, you know, like, okay, they're, they're okay, but I want to up my game. And talking to him about how much it normally runs, he's a good businessman. He's got a great, great place. It's not a backyard mechanic kind of thing, but he can look right. at it and go, you know what? This is presence. This is marketing for my company. It ups my value of my building, you know, to back to the staycation thing. You know, people are putting all kinds of money into their properties because it's a sound investment for them and it's something that they get to enjoy. And I just want to convey all that and tell that story to our customers and uh, viewers out there of here's a perfect example of how you can take things like this and turn them into profit. You can go out and whether it's a simple stain and reseal or it's a vertical rock or if it's, you know, whatever, you name it, fire pit, blah, blah, blah. But there's, uh, there's money to be made in that and there's profit to be made in that. And the higher the end client, the more, um, let me back up, the better your work, the higher end client that is going to pull in for you. And they're going to talk, they're going to see it, and then we'll have to do a couple of trick tip episodes on how to right. uh, market all that. But, uh, yeah. but anyways, so um, let's see what else. I think uh, I think I've pretty much exhausted the notes that I've got on this. How about you? Likewise, I think I've done enough rambling. So uh, yeah, um, I thought it was a great episode. Bobby brought up some good things that that I get my own world as an artist, and you know everybody has kind of a, a different mindset and a different observation lens. So um, really cool, kind of pulling pulling little things out of each other. So it's been great. Yeah, that's, uh, and uh, that's one of the things that I have noticed with me, like I said, I didn't have an, I don't have an artistic bone in my body, but I was able to learn, you know, and you're looking at it from an artist standpoint and you've done a great job of explaining, well, okay, you know, I saw you roll your eyes of why I'm, you know, did this, but here's why. And now I see it and it, it took away all the fear. I mean, I think it was from, um, maybe rich dad, poor dad book where he said, what keeps everyone from being rich? Number one thing is fear. Don't fear. Just go do it. Just do it. So, yeah. Stop the fear. Yeah. So anyways, we're yeah. going to close it out. Thanks guys, man. We really appreciate you continuing to log in, watch this show. Um, let us know what else you want to hear. You know, there's plenty of other topics out there that, uh, you know, we deal with every day. I know we're, kind of compiling a list for future shows. So by all means, engage, let us know, drop your comments below, um, hit the like button as many times as you possibly can. Let them do that. Yeah, tap, tap. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, follow us on all the social media things. We're here to engage and create a community of like-minded people. So, we can accelerate your growth. That's really what we want to do. I mean, we're kind of at the point in our careers now, you know, I've 
by no means have achieved it all. And there's no, by no means that I'm stopping because we just love it. We love what we do. We love helping people. So any questions, anything you got, by all means, reach out to us. Um, info at rocksculptor.com. Um, Rock Sculptor on Facebook. And what's the other? Instagram. Instagram. Instagram for you. All right. Mm -hmm. For us, obviously, it's uh, Facebook's kind of our, our area. YouTube right here. Um, this was an awesome one. Um, you can comment below. We turn the comments on because we want to hear from you. And if you need to reach me by email, it is info at turnic.us, not .com. We had to be a little bit different there, I guess. But anyway, so appreciate y'all. Have a great time. Make it great.